Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of our National Ostomy Canada Society webinar. We're so excited to have you here with us from wherever you're tuning in uh, from across Canada. Uh, I know we have quite a few people who are always joining us from coast to coast. I myself, uh, I'm Troy Curtis, uh, one of the directors on our board of directors uh, for Ostomy Canada Society, and I'm living in Ottawa, Ontario. Um, you'll notice that today our guest speaker, Lauren Wolf, who I'm going to introduce in just a moment, is joining us from the other side of the country. So we hope you'll uh, uh, feel connected to at least one of us uh, by proximity. Um, so before I get started, as you all know, um, we are going to be talking about navigating life adjustments and emotional well-being post-ostomy surgery. And I know Lauren's going to talk a little bit about some housekeeping items, but I just want to remind everyone that we're going to have a Q&A portion at the end. Uh, please do put your questions into the Q&A portion there. And thank you to those who've already submitted questions. We're going to have a, a poll feature uh, in this webinar too. So we invite you to participate in that, but there's no pressure if you're not as, uh, uh, don't want to engage with that, that's okay. But we do welcome you to uh, put your answers in. We'll show you how to do that in just uh, a few moments here. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to go over a, a little bit of our key topics that we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be exploring the intricate journey of life adjustments and emotional well-being following ostomy surgery, uh, recognizing that each person's experience is distinct and is influenced by factors ranging from the type of di uh, diagnosis to the permanence of the procedure. So uh, this webinar is going to showcase the emotional journey of living um, with an ostomy and the challenges you might face. Um, we're also going to talk about the critical role of support systems along this journey and whether you're facing it alone or with the support of friends and or, or family or your NSWOC or a combination of them all. Um, we really do hope that you're going to learn quite a bit today. Um, so we're very, very privileged to have with us today Lauren Wolf. Uh, Lauren graduated from nursing school in 1990 in South Africa and earned her Wound Ostomy Incontinence Certificate from Emory University in 2006. And in 2020, she completed her Master of Clinical Science in Wound Healing at Western University in Ontario. Uh, she's a certified Wound Ostomy Incontinence Nurse at McDonald's Prescriptions, Fairmont Location, and uh, Vancouver General Hospital. Known for her dedication, Lauren never turns a patient away and always seeks out answers for their needs. Lauren received the CRNBC Award for Nursing Excellence in 2011, uh, our Ostomy Canada NSWOC Recognition Award in 2023, just last year, and the VA Hospital Unsung Hero Award in 2024, again this year. Uh, she actively volunteers for the United Ostomy Association. She writes for the Vancouver Ostomy High Life and for our Ostomy Canada magazine as well. So you might have seen some, some of the stuff that Lauren's already put out there. Uh, she's also a lifestyle advisor with Ostomy Canada and supports patients in various groups. In her free time, Lauren enjoys traveling, reading, and spending time with her husband and two adult children. And today we have the privilege of having her here to talk to us a little bit. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to you, Lauren, and I'm going to be in the background here to help with anything we need to do uh, regarding the polls there. So I hope you all enjoy the webinar today, everybody. Hi, thank you for joining us. And Troy, thanks for that amazing um, introduction. Uh, let's see if I can advance the slides, which <laughs> despite all the prep, they are not. There we go. OK, so just a couple of things again, as Troy mentioned, um, we have the QR code if you don't have it handy and the link. Um, there will be polls throughout the presentation, so don't think after the first couple that they, they've stopped, if you could keep your phone handy. Uh, the main Q&A will be answered at the end of the presentation. And then just a reminder that individual medical advice cannot be provided when asking questions. Um, these, need, these questions will need to be discussed with your healthcare provider. Um, a quick disclaimer, um, as Troy introduced me, I am a registered nurse. I am not a counselor, psychologist or social worker. My clinic focuses on the whole individual with a strong focus on emotional well-being. All photographs used in this presentation have been used with permission as the videos as well. So just a little bit to build on what Troy said about me. So. As you heard, I'm a WOC nurse since 2006, also known as an NSWOC in Canada. Um, and, you know, over the past 18 years of doing this, um, most clinicians will hear me say that this is not a job to me. This is my life. And so I found that a significant portion of my clinic visits became helping individuals adapting to life with an ostomy. Like, Sometimes half the of the whole hour, about half of it is actually just talking about the emotional side of living with an ostomy. So 
Today I'm going to discuss some current literature combined with my years of experience because there is a real disjoint in this and you'll see that as I present the information. As noted, I work in two different locations, so I see both the acute side of it in the beginning and then I have the privilege of working in this clinic and helping individuals post-surgery. Um, so the first thing is, and I see there's a little bit of a delay, um, Troy Yasser, I'm not seeing the poll come up, are you? Yes, we see it coming up here. So this okay. is for, um, are you a registered nurse, a person with an ostomy or a nurse with an ostomy? So for those who are uh, who might be able to access the Q&A area, I did just put the uh, link to participate in the polls there. Um, you might be able to click that and enter it there. I see some people are adding it, or you can scan that little QR code with your cell phone uh, or your smartphone. Um, just use your camera function and hover over that QR code and she'll pull it up for you. So in the meantime, uh, it looks like we've got uh, a number of people responding, some people who are nurses with an ostomy, caregivers of an individual with an ostomy, RNs and an individual with an ostomy. Okay, so this information is really good for me because it just helps me tailor the presentation and I welcome everyone and hopefully the presentation will allow me to capture information that is important to everybody um, with an ostomy. So we'll move on to the next poll. Um, so for this one here, we're asking, have you had challenges adapting to living with an ostomy? So it's a yes or no question here, and we'll leave it open for a few seconds while we let people participate. And maybe just a few more seconds. Again, if you're having any trouble with uh, participating here with the polls and you just wanted to put in the Q&A, feel free to put it in there, and that's totally fine as well. Um, so it looks like we've got about 78% of people are saying, yes, we've had challenges adapting to living with an ostomy. Okay, so I'm really hoping that, and we're gonna, as we go through some more polls, we're gonna um, find out a little bit about what those challenges may be. So I think I'm gonna move on to the next poll um, to give me a little bit of a sense of why or how your ostomy was created. And on this one here, we've got a few different options for everyone here. It could be from cancer, could it be from Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, it could be from something else as well, uh, or instead. So leave it open for a couple more seconds here because we're getting quite a few different results here. Uh, just try and yes, so what I noticed on my other screen is there's a bit of a delay between, I think, what we see and what the participants see. Okay, yes, good point. So maybe we'll just wait a couple more extra seconds just to make it easier here. Lovely. Okay, so looking at a lot with cancer and a lot with others. So that one, you know, perhaps if you wouldn't mind for the people who have put in others, because that's a significant percentage of the poll. Can you let Troy and Yasa know what the other is to give me sort of just a sense of why, why ostomies are being created? Because in my practice, I predominantly see cancer and Crohn's and colitis with a few diverticulitis um, and volvulus, but in general, um, a lot of cancer usually. And that seems to be almost equal on the poll with Crohn's colitis. Um, okay, so thank you. So let's move on to the actual topic now. Um, as Troy mentioned a little bit about the objectives, one of the things I wanted to add in here was A, the literature, really need to look to the literature to, to validate your experience. Um, we're going to look at understanding an individual individual's journey and those factors that are going to influence post-adjustment, which you all already know. We're going to look at temporary versus permanent because that's come up for me as something in my practice do a couple of personal perspectives. We have a couple of videos. Um, and then the power of support, exploring the role of family, friends, and healthcare professionals. What are some practical strategies? Um, and at the end of it, I'd be happy to hear from you if I've missed anything and things that ha you have found to be helpful. Um, and then the value of a stoma nurse, because I really think that um, we can bring a lot, a lot of value. And for those of you who are not able to access a stoma nurse, I hope to be able to help you find a stoma nurse. Um, 
So I borrowed the slide from a colleague of mine, Arden, and I really loved it. I changed a few words, but talking about living with an ostomy is never easy. Each one of you have had a different experience. If at any time you feel emotional or have touched a button, feel free to take a minute, perhaps grab a glass of water. Remember to breathe, ground yourself by placing your feet on the floor. This topic can be really hard to discuss both for me and for you. So please, if you need to take a minute, go ahead. So I love these slidos, so sorry about this, but tell me what kind of ostomy you have. All right, and I'm seeing we've got a good seven, ten people participating. We'll keep it going for just a couple more seconds, but it is looking close to 50-50, uh, colostomy and ileostomy, a number of your ostomy uh, as well, and just a few who do not have an ostomy. Perfect. Thank you. Makes it easy for the not having any I don't knows. All right, so let's look at the literature. And this was very interesting for me, and I think you'll find it validates your experiences. So research identifies that individuals with a stoma can experience a change, and that's why you're all here tonight. Now, what are those changes? Well, some of them are depression. A lot was changes in body image, and it found that it was very much worse in the first few weeks, and I think you can probably identify with that, and a lot of low self-esteem in the beginning and eventually over time, the hope is that that improves. Feelings of uncertainty, decreased participation in social activities, decreased contact with friends and relatives, and sexual hesitancy. So these were a lot of common threads. Other insights from the literature were individuals with chronic disease experienced anxiety and depression. Um, so what that sort of brings up to mind is those of you with cancer or Crohn's and colitis, you've got a chronic disease underneath it. With the Crohn's and colitis, and you'll see this later in my presentation, in some ways an ostomy is a relief. But for those of you with cancer, it's, it's not so much. An ostomy is just another challenge because you've had a new diagnosis. Um, one systematic review found that individuals with an ostomy experienced a higher level as they had the double burden as I mentioned, of ostomy and chronic disease. And then many articles mentioned leakage, worrying about leakage, sore skin, which is what they call it in the UK, as you'll see a lot of my studies um, found are actually from Europe. Um, and that sore skin or denuded skin, as we call it in ostomy world here, causes a decrease in quality of life. Now, what was interesting in the literature these articles did not include access to a stoma nurse. Now, as Troy mentioned, I'm in BC and we have a lot of access and I have a feeling some of you are not. And that wasn't a question I asked in the polls of where you're located, but we're fortunate here that a lot of our patients do have access um, to a stoma nurse. So it was quite concerning to see that none of the studies really talked about whether individuals had access or not. So what are the gaps in the literature? Well, many of the studies were European, Middle East, South American. Uh, the studies were limited often to comparing inflammatory bowel and cancer. And Troy, when you've got a minute, let me know if people put in the chat what the other um, reason for their ostomy was. Yes. Um, uh, did you want right now or sure. In a, in a sec sure. We had a couple were saying a neurogenic bladder with severe urosepsis, bacterial infection. Uh, post spinal surgery as well, and then again, cancer was mentioned as in the in the chat too. Okay, good to know. So as you can see, the studies don't bring up any of those. All right. So uh, some of you, the SCI may have known. I did a previous presentation on that, and so again, that's a little bit of a different twist on things as to why you get an ostomy. But again, you're dealing with a chronic condition. Um, Sun studies compared ulcerative colitis versus Crohn's, and we know that for ulcerative colitis, a stoma is a cure, whereas for Crohn's, it's not a cure. You're still living with that chronic disease. So how can you compare those two um, when it comes to quality of life? Um, 
no studies looked at whether an ostomy was permanent or temporary, and you'll see some of my talking about that later on. Um, varied population, society, religious norms, um, it was all over the map. Some studies were sponsored by industry or they were small sample, small sample sizes um, and they looked at varying characteristics that you couldn't even compare all the different studies. Uh, most studies did not mention, as I met, said earlier, whether there was a stoma nurse involved in the care. Um, and strangely enough, one study recommended that the wound ostomy or ENSOC nurses receive counseling. No mention um, of whether they recommended that individuals with an ostomy um, should go for counseling. So I thought that interesting. I'd love to go for counseling, but I also know that it's important to my my patients or individuals living with an ostomy to have access to that resource. So if we look at what a pouching system looks like, there is a lot of talk now um, in Europe about the design of the pouching system. We're seeing a lot of change in them. So one article found that the size, bulkiness, ballooning, color affect an individual's adapting to living with an ostomy. So companies are continuing now to strive to make the pouching systems less medical and to have more choices. Um, challenges that come out with that is like we got black pouches now, we got ones with the fabric being really nice and different, is not all pouches work well for everybody. We have, I think it's six different ostomy companies now, and it's really about the closure, about the fabric, about the profile of the, the ostomy pouch. It's about the profile of your abdomen. So as much as you want to try to go to a non-medical designed looking pouching system, sometimes you don't have that choice. So all of that can affect how you adapt to living with an ostomy because it's like having that Gucci bag that you want to buy but can't afford it. Sometimes things just don't work out the way you want them to and you can't afford the black or the beige or whichever color you choose. So what I want to know from you is do you feel that the design of the pouching system impacts your emotional well-being or is industry just making us spend more money? So I'll let it go for just a couple more seconds, but it looks like we're leading the way with yes. yes. Uh, the answer yes is about two thirds to no, about one third, and I have no opinion is a little bit lower down. Right. I find this really valuable information because as an NSWAC, some of us have access to industry and we can take your feedback. Um, I'm not sure how many individuals are attending the webinar right now. Um, Troy has that information. Um, but I think that's really valuable that we can then push industry to make a better product for us and for you um, to give you more choice. Because if that's going to impact you this much, that many individuals, then, then we need to do better. So let's talk a little bit about the post-operative period. Uh, again, going back to the literature, according to one study, um, Marquis, um, this is an old study, 2003, um, they found that patients' quality of life improved in the first three to six months. Um, however, it was reliant on access to a stoma nurse, good relationship with a stoma nurse. We don't all like each other, and we might not get on with everybody, and therefore, that's important to be able to select the ostomy nurse that you do form a relationship with. Um, confidence in managing to change their stoma appliance. Um, and not everyone in those first few months are confident. And overall satisfaction with the care provided. So you can see it had a lot of um, positives that helped in those first three to six months. I concur with the above. However, Temporary versus permanent, I find, is very different. Um, the temporary stomas live to a reversal date. And they 
my patients don't really adapt as well as my permanent stomas. Um, I find there's a difference between cancer versus inflammatory bowel disease, because with cancer, as I said, it's a double whammy. Inflammatory bowel disease, often, not for Crohn's, but for colitis, you're making this choice. You've you're really sick. Often you've waited way too long. And so you've you've chosen to go and have an ostomy and you may feel a lot better afterwards. Um, individuals with stoma nurse support, support groups, family and friends definitely adjust faster and have an improved quality of life. So the pictures in here are me in the clinic um, with some of my patients who were very kind enough to let me take pictures. So some gaps. Studies identified that strong focus on physical. They really, everything came out that learning how to change an ostomy appliance and very little on the actual emotional side and how to help you manage that. Um, availability of stoma nurse and pre and post-op, my experience, there, there's a gap. Um, I, I opted to join the Facebook support group and I'm quite dismayed at how it seems that very few individuals posting have access to a stoma nurse, or they had access in the first maybe three to six weeks and then no longer. Um, Pre-op appointments, so your pre-surgery, there have been a lot of questions in the Facebook as well of individuals awaiting surgery. Um, and there seems to be a variance in whether you have an in-person visit, um, what is discussed, whether it's um, urgent surgery, you miss that experience. So that whole pre-op appointment um, can be quite um, variant across Canada. And for me, that appointment is really important because I form a rapport with the individual and I prepare you for what's to come, answer your questions, that when you go in for surgery, you're a little bit more prepared and hopefully can decrease that anxiety of what a stoma bag looks like, um, how often to change it, and just answer any basic questions. So now I want to know how many of you actually have access to a stoma nurse? So just a reminder, I'm talking about now in today's world while you, not when you first came out of hospital, unless you just come out. Okay, so we're looking at about two thirds of individuals almost. Uh, yes, no, uh, changing. Okay, I feel 25, but no longer have one. So I think two thirds have access to a stoma nurse. So that's really good to hear um, because I think it's important. For those of you who don't, I'm going to give you a link to find a stoma nurse later on in the presentation from Enzo Canada. And hopefully we can help you find a stoma nurse if you want one. Okay. So fact, what are so now leaving some of the polls for the moment, leaving the literature a little bit. Um, what are factors influencing post-op adjustment? So a lot of times it's access to care. The cost of supplies and income is huge, and I say it's huge because depending where you live in uh, in Canada is how that is going to affect you. We know that Alberta has amazing um, coverage. We know that Manitoba. Um, if you use, I believe, the contract of product supplies has coverage, and we know that BC works on a deductible system. My understanding for the rest of the country, um, it's not as um, helpful. It co supplies cost a lot. You have coverage anywhere from, I think it's $800 a year, $800, um, to potentially no coverage, the, unless you've got private insurance. And that can really weigh on you. If you don't have the finances, you're trying to stretch your product to last as long as possible. Your skin may break down. All of that is going to affect your post-op adjustment and weigh on you at all times. 
whether you have friends and family support, that that's big. We all need somebody to rely on. Um, what's your diagnosis? Um, you know, is this a diagnosis that um, you can get over, like ulcerative colitis? Um, or is this a diagnosis that you're going to live with for the rest of your life as well, whether it is cancer and you're on chemo, um, whether you have Crohn's disease and you're going to be living with Crohn's all the time, um, this SCI people, you know, you're going to be keeping your stoma for continence reasons. All of that is going to impact how you adjust as well. Your pre-op preparation is going to play a factor. Your age may play a factor. Um, because if you're older, you may be needing more help. You may be needing less help. It just varies on that. And how many peristomal complications are you having? Um, what I noticed on the Ostomy Canada Facebook page is that this information that I gathered from the literature is definitely corroborated. There are multiple posts asking questions and looking for advice and support on all of these being the cost of supplies, the prep for pre-op and peristomal complications. Um, so, you know, just to validate how you are feeling. So remember I mentioned that I was curious about temporary versus permanent as I felt that the patients um, of mine who had a temporary lived to reversal date. So how many of you have a temporary versus a permanent stoma? Um, so that poll will be coming up now. Okay, so 100% of you have permanent stomas, and that explains why you're here listening to me prattle on about the emotional stuff. Um, and trying to help you is because you have a change in body image. And we're going to talk a little bit moving forward now. We've dealt with all the literature, we're going to move forward to a little bit more. And so this slide doesn't really um, speak to you as much because you've all got permanent. So if we look at the permanent, you know, as I mentioned, it's going to depend on your progress. You're going to need time to adjust. You're going to need a support system. Um, but you often adjust faster, as I mentioned, than those of people living with the temporary. What are some of your post-op emotions? Um, and this can be anywhere from one day through to however many days to years it takes. You may have low energy. You may feel sad. You may feel overwhelmed. Learning how to apply a pouching system might be easy for me 18 years later, eight stomas a day. But for you who's new dealing with many things, this can be really anxiety producing. Exhaustion. Most likely you're getting up at night, so you're not getting your full six to eight hours of sleep. But even when you are sleeping, you're worrying that the pouch will leak. You may be scared to go out. What will people think? Will I smell? Can anyone see the pouch? How will I empty the pouch when I go out? You may say, why me? So I want to encourage you to not be alone. Reach out to a friend, a family member, a stoma nurse, somebody that can help you through this journey. Don't be shy or scared because people want to help you. Now, before we move on to more of the stoma, we need to talk about grief because you are grieving when you have a stoma. There are five stages of grief and in no particular organ or order, we have bargaining, denial, anger, depression, acceptance. Originally, everyone thought these went in a very linear pattern. I think you start at bargaining saying, why did I get this, etc." and denial moving all the way up. But what we've learned is that the stages of grief look nothing like that. You can be one minute really angry, the next you can be bargaining, then you're gonna go back to anger, then you might go to denial, and you're going to work it in this big jumbled mess. And it may take you a week, and it may take you years, okay? So know that you are your, your feelings are 
okay to be all over the place and you just need to give yourself a little bit of time. The grieving process is unique to you. We're all different individuals and we really need to recognize that the mold that I fit into may not be the mold that you fit into. Your grieving process is going to depend on your previous experience, what support you have available to you, whether it is a stoma nurse, family, even just having a dog at home. Um, and it's going to depend on your personality. Okay. Everyone is different. And that's an okay thing to be unique and different. So some of the um, symptoms of grief are very similar to the symptoms of bereavement. So I did a lot of looking at this. As I mentioned, I'm not a counselor, but you'll see that a lot of these symptoms of grief are what are echoed in the literature with individuals getting stomas. The sadness, the despair, the emptiness, the disbelief, the guilt, shame, the anger, fatigue, fear, anxiety. When you look at the symptoms of bereavement, they're very similar. OK, so recognize that you are grieving. I always say to my patients, it is losing a body part. It's just not visible. OK, so somebody who's had an amputation of an arm or a leg, you can see it. But when somebody's lost the ability to go to the bathroom, normal, what we call normally using your bottom or voiding if you have a urostomy, Nobody associates that with a loss, and I do. I really say to people, it's no different than losing a limb, and you need to give yourself time, time to heal, time to accept, and it's okay to feel sad and horrible for a while. Remember, I talked about Crohn's and colitis and cancer. So cancer patients, it's a new diagnosis. You need to process that new diagnosis and you need to process having a stoma. And often you just don't have the time. You're suddenly thrown into chemo, radiation. Um, you're worried about your prognosis. It's, it's really hard. Um, so having someone to talk to about all those feelings that you're experiencing is really important. Your Crohn's and colitis, you might be having a positive experience, but you may be having a negative because you may have different complications around your stoma than others. So it might really depend on whether you're um, having an uncomplicated stoma or challenges with your actual stoma. I found this quote really interesting. There are really only two stages of grief, who you were before and who you are after. So I don't know about this, and we'll talk about this with the question and answers perhaps later, but is this grief? I don't know. Or who you were before versus who you are now, because you may be a different person afterwards. You have a challenge that you now need to deal with. So are you the same person you were before? Online. Online is a very interesting, or social media, if you want to call it. Um, it's a really interesting phenomena as we move into this world. So I'm old. I struggle with a lot of this. And I'm learning to love and hate it. All right. So a lot of times you get amazing information um, on all the um social media platforms. Um, you can Google everything. As nurses and doctors, we say, be careful of Google doctor because you'll think you have symptoms for every disease in, out there in the world. Um, and I think we need to recognize that we each are individuals, or let me say, we are all individuals, but so are you. And your ostomy experience may be different than another person's. Um, a lot of the um, information online is not um, guided by any medical individuals. It's personal experience, which is really important, but it can have negative connotations for you if you don't have that same experience. You may have a different body shape. You may have a different kind of stoma. Being, It may not be as raised as the other person. Um, you, your body habitus may be very different. So 
individuals who are very thin, individuals who are very large, individuals who are just right. All of that is going to play into if you've got a six pack abdomen, if you've got like my tummy, which is a little bit flabby. So you're now listening to an individual um, who can wear their pouch for a week, but that may not be your experience. And that can make you have negative um, feelings towards your stoma. So really recognizing that your experience may not align. And I worry with the online that you, you, you're you asking too much of yourselves. So please be aware that if you're going to use online experience and use it as your support, which it, I really want to encourage you to, but, but just Put everything into perspective and seek medical help to help validate are you experiencing what you should be experiencing when it comes to especially wear time and how you're feeling. Um, because as I said, everyone is different. When it comes to ostomy supplies, I think it can make you feel really challenged when you hear that in in BC, it goes on a deductible, and even within BC, if you don't meet your deductible, it's not covered, then you've got to worry about it. So the person who's getting 100% covered in their supplies really may find that they're not worried because they don't have to pay for that, but you do, and therefore that's impacting your quality of life. So please be, be cautious. Don't not go online cautious in how you take the information that you're hearing. Um, so I would like to know at this point, what is your biggest stressor? And this one's going to come up a little bit differently because I think I did a a word diagram of something as you I think you have to type in here. Um, so if it's not going to work, it's OK. Well. OK, we've they're got one person typing. We'll go slow. They are coming up on time. my end. It, okay. not, it might not be the, the sharing. So we've got odor is one of our largest ones. Okay. Uh, new at this, basically all of the above. Skin complications and leakage, intimacy, body image, ostomy failure, leakage, dating, acceptance, uh, runny stool, low energy, uh, intimacy with my husband, skin issues, um, pain, so the, at the end of the day here, it's looking like the top ones were uh, body image, intimacy, odor, travel, leakage. OK, so I think I caught a few of those. Um, definitely what you're identifying is very much what many individuals with an ostomy identify with. Body image is really a big one. Um, so you're changing shape, often you're bulging, you're lopsided, you get a lot of noise, leakage, the isolation, embarrassment, odor, mess. So let's talk a little bit about body image. So your body image pre-surgery, and now you have a body image post-surgery that looks a little bit different, um, perception of self. Um, that is something you need to work on is how you perceive yourself. You've got to learn to love your body and it's hard. Anytime you have something that looks different, anytime that you feel different, it is going to affect your body image. Acceptance of your stoma. So interestingly enough, probably 50-50, I wrote an article on this years ago, of whether you name your stoma or not. Some people find that helpful. I had one young patient who named his stoma Winnie the Pooh. I have other patients who name them Matilda. They seem to like to go for the really old 1920s names or so. Um, apologies if anyone's called Matilda on the webinar. Um, but they go for the older names. Um, but like any um, change to body image, you have to learn to love yourself and how you view your body. Um, what can you do with clothing? So some of the options for clothing when it comes to body image is don't choose plain colors. So when you have a plain shirt, like a black or a white or a green, it is 
much more noticeable to see an ostomy pouch. When you have something with a design on it, whether it's checkers, flowers, um, anything, it makes it a little bit more difficult in order to see your stoma. Now, if you're somebody who has a large hernia, that is going to be a little bit more challenging. Um, when it comes to intimacy and wanting to cover up your stoma, it's really good to go and get one of the wraps. You don't need hernia support belts for that, but there are a lot of wraps um, online at different companies. I think I have it coming up later, but Comfies is one. Um, uh, Stealth Belt, I believe, is another one. Pouchways is another one. Um, and you can Google and find a lot of things. Be careful spending a lot of money because you don't have to cover your stomach when you're intimate. It just may be something you want. And you could even take a scarf and wrap it around your waist. Um, when Clothing, um, some people, you know, want to say, well, I can't wear my clothes over um, my ostomy pouch. And I want to say that's a choice. And I have a feeling one of my colleagues is on the webinar and I'm going to share her story because I chuckle every time I see her because she's young and she wears her jeans. You would never know she has an ostomy and she wears her regular clothing. Um, and I think people are scared to um, push on their stoma. Um, you can wear clothes over your stoma. You are not going to hurt your stoma by wearing jeans or leggings or shorts. Um, sometimes for the men, it can be a little bit harder because you, if you've got a bit of a tummy, you often wear your pants underneath um, your stoma pouch. Um, a lot of my patients might go and buy suspenders to hold their pants up. Um, and, you know, I'm sure we can work on something to answer some questions if you're struggling with that. But there are no restrictions to your clothing. You're the one um, who needs to figure out which which clothes work for you from a fashion perspective um, and from what you can access. But from a stoma perspective, you can wear whatever you want. Um, so there was a question online today, and so we thought we would just add this in a little bit quickly um, about talking to children about your ostomy. So if some of you have young children, um, how do you address that? The first thing I would say, and I haven't had a chance to review any literature on this, so this is my personal feeling, is give it time. Um, it's similar to dating. It's not something you talk about on your first date. So just with children, let them be curious. Let them initiate the conversation. Hey, mom, what's that on your body? Or hey, dad. Um, and then, you know, really explain to your child or your children that you might poop or pee. Use words that you use at home a little differently to them. Um, explain that they poop from their bottom. You now poop into a bag. And that's okay. Um, they often may be scared because they're worried that you're sick. So reassure them that you are OK. Um, if, on the other hand, it's the child that has the ostomy and they're questioning that, there are a lot of resources um, from different companies, more so that I've seen um, from Colostomy UK. And I popped the link up there quickly. I haven't had a chance to look to see what Ostomy Canada or Enswa Canada has. Um, but I know in the UK, a lot of the companies put out books for children and they'll have um, teddy bears with stomas or bunnies with stomas. Um, and I know I've given some to Children's Hospital here in, in Vancouver because every time I go over to the UK, I grab a few of those books. Um, but if anyone else has any ideas on how they've told children and want to pop it in the chat that we can look at later, I think that would be great. So coming back to, here we go, here's my slide, dressing with an ostomy pouch. So you can wear your pre-surgery surgery clothes. There's no concern in squishing your stoma. Wear clothing with a design, loose-fitting shirts or T-shirts with an open button um, down over. So these patients all have stomas. These are not my patients. And then comfies, pouchways, stealth belt. And your stoma nurse should be able to give you a lot more resources. Exploring the role of family, friends, and healthcare professionals, not everyone has a good support system. Oftentimes, you might feel that you're a burden. You might feel restrictive. You don't want to talk. You might feel embarrassed. 
you might not want to ask for help. And that's going to cause you to feel alone and isolated. So how can we help you connect with family and friends? Really share how you feel. It's hard. Sharing is never easy. And sometimes we want others to sort of predict how we feel. Um, I, I, I love to share personal stories, and this is not ostomy related, but I, I had the misfortune of spending time with one of my children and she was not happy that I was with her. I was with her for too long. And I finally had to say to her how she was making me feel. Um, and it was very uncomfortable as a mom saying to your daughter, you really don't make me feel very welcome here. She was very busy at work and I was there in a, in a home in a very small apartment. And it was hard for both of us. But by sharing with her how she was making me feel, we were over to over. We were able to overcome that. Um, don't be scared to ask for help. If you can't ask your family and friends for help, seek a counselor. Seek a um, um, a, a stoma nurse, somebody who can help you. Um, today, I saw a patient who with a stoma who had recently lost her son as well, and what came out was she loves horses. And her children grew up around horses. And there are a lot of um, different counseling with horses. Horses are actually amazing um, support animals. Um, so really seek help. Family and friends are often wanting to help you, but they don't know how. So they want you to make the first move. And sometimes in person may be awkward. So it might just be a text and say, hey, how you doing? Can we go grab a cup of coffee? And slowly you'll get more comfortable with them. Give your family and friends permission to reach out and help because they don't know how to react around you. Managing grief. Be patient and kind to yourself. Give yourself permission to grieve. It takes time. A problem shared is a problem halved. Movement is medicine. Okay, so exercise. You might have been told, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. But going out for a walk is really important. In BC, we tell you to get outside. We tell you also to take some vitamin D or get a mood light because we're terrible here. We have gray skies for probably three quarters of the year, and that can really make you feel depressed. Find a hobby. Get creative. Knowing when to seek help, support groups, counselors. So Ostomy Canada has this great Facebook page. It gives a lot of support in sharing your worries, just hearing from other patients. Remember I said the medical side of it, be cautious with, but knowing there's somebody there for you is really helpful. What we know is that positivity breeds positivity. Celebrate your success. If you've been leaking a lot and you went two days with no leaks, celebrate that. Um, this is from Sue Ostomy. I love this, dear body. I still can't love every part of you, but, and you can fill in the blank here. I'm watching time and we got to go faster. So here's a little bit of a story from a patient. Hi, Maureen. Thanks for joining me today, talking a little bit about your journey of navigating an ostomy and the effects it has on you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey with an ostomy? Sure. I'm 77 years old now. Um, my journey started in 2014, the, the end of the year, just before Christmas time, I had a bleed, which I knew wasn't right. So I went to my doctor and had a checkup and everything. And we ended up with a hysterectomy to make a long story short. And uh, with, oh, it, would, it isn't cancer, it isn't cancer. And it ended up being cancer. And it turned into um, chemo and all of that. And I had a few good years with just de dealing with after effects of chemo. And then I had a little bit of a blip in the road, had a, a cyst that they was benign. And then I had another one that happened. And this time it penetrated my, um, my bowel and I ended up with the ostomy. So that was my first go around. So that would have been in, I guess I was 73 by the time that happened. So, And that was a colostomy and that was meant to be temporary, right? Yes, it was a temporary, suppose, and they said I could have it reversed in a year. <laughs> and, and how did you feel sort of when you got your ostomy? 
Well, they, they, you, your nurses do a great job preparing you for it. So they mark you and you're going through all that mental stuff before. Uh, getting it was a shock. I, I'm not going to lie. It was a, a big surprise, you know, waking up and putting your hand down there and feeling it. But um, I felt personally, I felt grateful because um, ovarian cancer is something you don't may, know many people that have gotten through with it. So I figure, well, OK, this is good. We'll carry on. So it was it was shock. I'm not going to lie. OK, and then how many months later did you go for a reversal? So it was over a year. I think I could have done it in the January, February of that year. Um, but I ended up waiting because COVID was on at the time. So I ended up waiting till October and I ended up um, had the reversal at the beginning. And then it was within two weeks I was back in for the permanent. It didn't work. So what didn't work with it? Well, I guess because of where my um, original cancer was, there was um, a breakthrough in the wall of my vagina. So I had a fistula, I believe it's called. So I was, um, it was, wasn't going to work. It just. <laughs> so assuming, you know, you're going in for this reversal, you're like, wow, I'm getting rid of that ostomy. Um, and then you discover you got a permanent one. Tell us a little bit about that emotional roller coaster you went on and how did you navigate that? Well, I think, first of all, I'm a very positive person and I believe that has a lot to do with it. I felt like I, even when the whole thing began with the cancer, I felt, well, you got two choices. You either, you fight it or you give up and I'm not one to give up. So I, I have a really good positive outlook and I had very good support. I've got, I had you as my nurse, which for me was, the biggest thing because the more you know and the more you learn about your body and about how things go it does help you cope better so i learned a lot of strategies i learned a lot about my body i learned about what i can do so uh yeah i think i i navigated it pretty well <laughs> and other than you know me your nurse as a support system i know you have a good family support system yes uh, friends Lot of good friends. I can talk. I'm encouraged. They they understand about you know what I have when I go out, what I need to take with me, what I need to do. My daughter-in-law was, was amazing through that first leg of process where you're learning the bag and how to do it, and and the, my family was super encouraging. I I really I, I I never felt alone. Let's put it that way. And so for me, I reflect that back on you as. What I'm hearing is you didn't hide the fact you had an ostomy. You shared it with your friends and family. Yes. Um, very open about it. Yes. Yeah. I think that was the best way to go so that we had a strategy if I went out. Because in those that first year is hard when you're still learning your body and what your body's doing. So if, whenever we went in, I never stopped doing anything. I went everywhere, went for dinners. And I'd say to them, if I don't come out of look for me and bring my purse. <laughs> So everybody was aware and they were all on board and very helpful. Now, I know that you lead a very active life. Um, can you share with us some of the activities and things you do and the travel? And yes. Yeah. And, I, and I'll and i say to everybody, that was a big thing for me because I thought, oh, I'm never flying again. I'm never going to go in a public washroom and all of the things that I, I did and I hurtled and I felt I felt so good when I did it. I even had to empty on a plane, which was pretty tough, but I did it. And I'm so proud of myself that I did do that, you know, and the first time I had to go in a, we were in Fort McMurray at a baseball game. I had to go in a public washroom and I thought, oh my God, I'll never live through this. And it was, everything was fine. You know, my family said, look, you, you did it. You can do this, you know? So I exercise regularly. I lawn bowl. I go to, um, I walk, I do fitness classes. Um, I very rarely sit during the day. I set myself goals. I my, my goal is to get back to where I was before all this happened and I keep working on it. But I also know that there's sometimes when I don't feel well, things happen and I never let it get me down. I keep, okay, let's go back to where we were and let's start again. So I think that's attitude has a lot to do with it. You know, I, I really think that's got a lot in my favor. Was there ever a time where you 
didn't feel great and just <laughs> felt a little bit sorry for yourself, maybe? Oh, yes, absolutely. I had I allowed myself a little pity party every once in a while. And I do a little cry and I'll, uh, I'll just say, well, no, you got two choices. You get on board or you you give up and I, I won't. That's my motto anyway. So, yes, I have had times. And even doing this, preparing for this talk with you, I had a, a few tears remembering some of the times because I tend to put it off that, that it didn't happen. But um, there was some bumpy times, but I feel really good that I I feel like now it's just part of me and I don't even think about it anymore. Oh, that's really great to hear. Now, if you have to give the audience any tips, tricks, advice, suggestions, what do you think would your take home message be? Well, I think if you want to talk practical, I, I bought myself a backpack. So for a woman, my backpack is with me all the time. People, they have their little designer purses. I have a backpack. And in that backpack is my life, as far as I'm concerned. It goes with me everywhere. So I feel prepared, which takes away a lot of pressure. You're never going to be stuck. Um, the other thing I can say is don't hide who you are. It's, it's, it's really everybody has something. And it's not a disability, in my opinion. It's um, just part of my life. I think a positive attitude helps. And don't think you can't do stuff, because you can you can do anything within your limit, whatever you were doing before, you can still keep doing. I think that attitude has a lot to do with it. And and just your friends, you know, do things, get out. So just to mention one quick thing, you say don't hide it. But I know that when I've seen you in clinic, you are dressed impeccably. And I wouldn't be able to tell that you have an ostomy. That's true. You know? <laughs> and so your choice of clothing has really made a difference as well. And I know that often comes up for some individuals is what clothing should I wear? How can I sort of minimize the fact that yeah. I have most to me? Is any suggestions on that part? Yeah, that, that was a bit difficult, too, because I'm a little proud of myself as well. But yes, I don't like it. I won't wear tight things. I try to find tops that are not baggy, loose but just sort of around the middle so that you don't feel like it's protruding. Because as we know, there's days when it's worse than others. But um, I feel really, I get up in the morning, I dress for the day and I, I try to look the best I can, no matter what, even if it's staying at home. So I think a little bit of makeup, you know, a nice top and a pair of slacks, you know, loose fitting, but not frumpy, you know? So yeah, I think that that's, you're right. I do do that. <laughs> I know it's always lovely seeing you in the clinic and I want to really thank you for taking these few minutes. I gave you very little prep time with deciding last night to ask you and I know the audience will be very appreciative that you've shared how you've navigated living with an ostomy. So well, once again, thank you. I'm very happy to have done it and I hope it helps somebody because it you can do it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Recording on Hi, everyone. So just to let you know, we are going to be running a little bit late. I hope Maureen's talk, but I'm going to move through quickly. So some of the practical strategies for promoting emotional well-being and quality of life. Take one day at a time. Book an appointment to your see your stoma nurse. Now, it's pretty small there and maybe Troy can pop it in the chat. But if you don't have an NSWAC, there is a find an NSWAC um, on the website, um, both Ostomy Canada and NSWAC. Um, join a support group. Ideally, one that has a medical professional as a facilitator or who goes and can also just ensure that the um, the medical advice being asked is actually and answered is actually um, correct. Be cautious, as I mentioned, with online blogs and social media. Um, some ostomy company discharge programs will provide an emotional support program for you. Um, see a counselor. Don't be scared. There's no stigma anymore in going for counseling. We all need to talk to somebody. And sometimes our family is just too close to us. And we might need to talk to a counselor to just help us navigate. I want to share with you Alex's story as well. So I'm going to have a I'm quick listen. Alex, um, who has an ileostomy um, and has had it for a number of years. What was the deciding factor for you um, to go through with your surgery? 
Uh, well, I've been suffering from Crohn's for quite a while. Um, at this stage, I've been in a hospital for um, a number of times and my longest day being two months. So I basically lived there uh, and I couldn't do anything that I wanted to do anymore. Uh, and ultimately, it was just like, let's just try this. And worst case scenario, I'm where I'm currently at. <laughs> so what were the types of things that you were wanting to do that you could no longer do anymore? I'm big into backcountry snowboarding, so climbing uh, mountains and snowboarding down them. I really love kiteboarding in the summer. Uh, basically, outdoor activities, more on the extreme adventure side of uh, things. What would you say your life has been like since you've had your surgery? The uh, quality of your life? The quality of life is unbelievable. Like, I honestly, I didn't think that it could be this good. Um, I do everything that I possibly want to. I've climbed mountains, snowboarded down them. I've even uh, run an ultra marathon, 50 kilometers through the mountains, uh, successfully with an ostomy. Um, I day to day life is totally fine. It was incredible, and and I just get to live my life according to my wants and needs, and that's great. Do you have any regrets about having had the surgery? None whatsoever. I'm very open and honest um, with my friend group, um, the people that might need to know I have an ostomy. Um, everybody accepts me for who I am. Uh, people that I knew before really love to see how healthy I am now. People that didn't know me before um, just accept me for who I am because I'm honest and open with them. And I've, I have not experienced any kind of regret, whether it's um, personal, physical, or um, social. Comes to mind, I know that you're in a relationship right now. Has there been any challenges in having a bag and having a relationship? How's that been for you? That's been totally fine. Um, again, I was pretty honest going into the relationship. Uh, she knew that I had the ostomy and was very accepting of it. Um, and, you know, curious about it. She's seen my stoma. Int intimacy is totally fine. She's totally okay with it. And, um, yeah, it's just part of who I am, and, and we don't even really notice it. Yeah. Is there anything you would say that you can't do since having your ostomy that you might have been able to do pre-surgery? I, I honestly can't think of anything. Um, like, I go, I'm in the water, I am uh, dress up fancy, go to a wedding, uh, <laughs> go out my friends you know go to a local pub for a drink go you know um you name it i've been able to do it i've flown on airplanes gone on vacation uh, there's really nothing uh that has held me back uh, because of the ostomy aside from you know a little bit of pre-planning and making sure that i have a way to empty my bag or where i'm going uh, and sometimes it just takes a little bit of a heads up, hey, I'm going to need to do this at some point. So just plan for it. <laughs> Would you rate your quality of life better or worse since having you asked me? Oh, I would uh, definitely go on the side of better. <laughs> yeah, I was up on my feet. I was back into the mountains, back on the water. You know, um, just the, the turnaround and recovery is so um, good as long as you put in the work and do the rehab. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks for today. That's great to hear. And thanks for sending me that amazing cliff jumping picture of you. <laughs> I want to know how your bag didn't go flying off as you landed in the water. I want to know how I jumped off that cliff. I'm terrified of bite. So as you can see, Alex um, is pretty comfortable with his ostomy and does things that many of us who don't have an ostomy wouldn't even consider doing. Um, you've now heard two stories um, of individuals who have had, you know, positive experiences. Maureen, it took a little bit of time to get there. And Alex, because Alex had um, ulcerative colitis, was able to jump back right in. Did I mention oh, um, oh. Got to go back to Alex. So Alex is um, going to be running another marathon and raising money. So just a quick uh, push for Alex. If you're wanting to donate or become a sponsor of his, uh, you can scan the QR code or you can just get in touch with Alex uh, with Ostomy Canada. Um, it's on their website. Okay. 
Um, so one of the things I want to mention is don't let your ostomy define you. Don't think of it as a disability. Think of it as an ability. Um, another quote I want to give is the importance of touch. Um, not everyone likes to be touched, but I learned this quote way back in nursing school, and we're talking 30 years ago. So too often we underestimate the power of touch, a smile, a kind word, a listening ear, an honest compliment, or the smallest act of caring, all of which have the potential to turn a life around. This is Louis Biscaglia, and my nursing instructor um, played us a tape of Louis Biscaglia's, and 30 years later, it still resonates with me. A quote that I developed is, don't let your ostomy control you. You control your ostomy. Not a bag for life, but a bag for living. So for those of you who it was a life-saving procedure, which most of you it is, think of it as it saved your life. Okay, so in the top little one, my ostomy is a second chance of life. We are finished the presentation, but I'd like to address any comments and Troy was going to summarize some of the questions that may have come in the chat. I apologize for going over. If you need to leave, I understand it. But if you have any questions that you'd like me to answer, please pop them in the chat. And I'm really happy um, and appreciate that you attended this evening's uh, presentation. And I hope that I've answered some of your questions. Um, why can't a colostomy be reversed after radiation? Um, that one is t often the radiation has destroyed a lot of the muscle tone and you will be incontinent of stool or may be incontinent. It's not a will or a won't. Um, and so that may um, impact it and the surgeon may be unsure. So it's a discussion that you need to have as to what damage was done. Um, the defective devices... Um, Companies do have them. I can't say how often. Um, it asked me was required to deal with incurable um, C. diff in the large. That there are some people who have that, and it's very unfortunate that you have that experience. I'm not sure what the question is related to it, though. Um, the next one was told initially it was reversible, so I was just getting through. Um, remember I said temporaries, you live to the reversal date. Um, everything only to be told five months ago that it's not reversible. That is very tough, and that's why I often say that when you're told in the beginning it's permanent, you're you're able to, to get to that place of acceptance a lot sooner than the person who, you know, is told it's temporary and now goes through, similar to what Maureen a little bit went through, where you're now finding out it's permanent, and you're back to stage one of that grieving phase and having to deal with the change in body image and the acceptance of a stoma. And I, I'm really sad for you that that's happened, but I hope that you'll get to the acceptance point at some time. Um, so two different shops, absolutely. Um, how do you wear a stoma or hernia belt without a pancaking? I'm assuming you have a colostomy. Um, when it comes to a colostomy, if it is, I usually um, recommend a specific company's um, hernia belt with an opening. I'm very particular with my hernia belts because I don't believe in having what's called a soft opening. I feel they don't give you enough support to prevent the hernia, but that's my personal appearance. So I, I'm very particular about using only one company's hernia belt that requires generally an ostomy nurse to measure you as it's a custom belt. Um, Troy, I only see those yeah. questions. Well, let, let me, I, I can go over a couple here and I know we're over okay. time, so we'll try to keep them fairly efficient. Um, one person was asking, so this person in, in particular has an ileostomy. Um, they're wondering if uh, you've ever heard of side effects sometimes with, uh, despite drinking plenty of fluids throughout the day, um, they wake up with a dry mouth at night or they find that they're still very thirsty um, in the evening. Is this something that you've run into or any general tips for staying hydrated with an ileostomy, but being uh, being aware of that? There are a few things with um, dehydration with an ileostomy is how you drinking. And I, I again had this discussion in clinic today. Um, gulping water, drinking a whole glass all at once will come right out through your ostomy. 
Um, so you need to sip on it. Don't use straws. Um, eating something salty while you're drinking. So some pretzels, potato chips um, to help absorb. You need salt to help absorb the water to get it into your systemic system, into your blood system. Um, oftentimes I encourage people to do an electrolyte drink. I'm partial to noon. I don't particular I find hydrolyte and pedialyte more expensive and not as great Gatorade is not necessarily the best it's got sugars in it even the Q, um, the G2 has um, um, aspartame and, and the sugar substitutes which can cause higher output as well so be very cautious I think there's drip drop and I think Alex uses a different one and I can't recall what one he uses be cautious of your hydration but you need sodium salt to help the water move into your system um, that should help but I think that's a bigger discussion you may need to um, talk to a dietitian or a stoma nurse um, to help guide you on that Thank you for touching on that. I'm just going to iterate what's proceeding in the chat here. Some people saying, just want to say I've had my ileostomy for 11 years and don't regret it one bit. Mine is permanent. And I was supposed to be temporary, but if you're getting one, you will be okay. So thank you for the kind words and sharing that experience there. Thank you for the uh, excellent interactive presentation as well. Um, just a couple, maybe we'll do two more questions pretty quickly here. Um, one person's asking about how often um, uh, the ostomy device itself uh, replacing the, the the, the device uh, as a whole, um, do you want to comment on replacing sure. the whole device or the lifespan? So we call it wear time. So how long you can wear an ostomy bag. And that is really up to your body and up to you and up to your finances. So generally speaking, the companies will tell you that an ostomy pouching system in a perfect world can last up to seven days. I know some people get longer than that. But really, the wear time is based on your stoma, your anatomy, your body contours, where you live. If you're in a hotter climate, you may be changing more frequently. So as we're all going through this heat wave, you may find you're changing your pouch more often. Um, it may be if your stoma is flat or raised. I aim for twice a week changes because I like to teach my patients to like brushing your teeth, you know, you brush them morning and evening. I hope we all do. Um, so giving them set days versus counting three days and four days and five days, I find you've, you spend your life counting how often to change, when to change it. Some people will write a date on it. Um, so I aim for twice a week. Not everyone can afford that. Um, if you have the finances um, to change more frequently, that's good. If you don't, you may be trying to stretch your pouching system to last longer. Um, just never compromise your skin. The best way to determine your wear time is when you take it off, look at the back of the flange, what's been against your skin, and look to see if there's been any leakage. So you're looking for poop or urine that's moved away from the immediate area around your stoma, because that's called a leak within the system. Anything beyond that or outside the bag is a leak without the system. And if your skin is sore or broken, you need to speak to a stoma nurse, you need to get into the right system for you, and it may be changing a bit more frequently until your skin is healed. Thank you for touching on that. I think that covers uh, another question that came in a little while ago, um, just generally uh, about skin related issues. And I encourage anyone who uh, who is on the call right now, and you might have some more questions. Maybe it's about diet. Maybe it's about gas and bloating. Maybe it's about skin issues. We do have some uh, great uh, both articles or blogs written on the Ostomy Canada website, including from some uh, people on our medical lifestyle advisory committee like Lauren. We also have some past webinars, so I encourage you to check those out because there's a lot of great tips and tricks for uh, managing any skin issues and whether it's caused by leakage or or anything like that so uh, do check those out and on that note i know we're going a little bit over time here um there was a question about someone who wanted to become a certified visitor wanted to become more part of the ostomy visitors program um if you don't have a local peer support group or chapter that you're a part of um, if you want, don't mind sending us an email we'll look into to seeing what solutions we have for you um, i put my email in the chat there but if you um, don't have it there just go to our ostomy canada website we have an info one at ostomycanada.ca that you can send general queries into.
Um, so with that, um, I'm, I'm going to say thank you so much uh, to Lauren for a fantastic presentation. I'm iterating what everybody else is saying here too. We truly, truly appreciate you sharing this. And I think uh, I speak on behalf of everyone here um, uh, that it's been it, um, helpful to have an opportunity to hear from other people's experiences. And, you know, creating that community is always a great, great feeling. And um, hearing that you're not alone is, is always going to be very important. So um, I think the topic was great today and you delivered it very well. And uh, I know this won't be the last time we, we see you or hear from you. I, I know you're very close with Austin Canada, both locally and, uh, and nationally as well. So we look forward to speaking to you again and hearing from you. Thank you. If anyone has further questions, please put them through Ostomy Canada's advisory. Mm -hmm. That way, everybody, um, when we answer them, everybody can have access to them because I'm sure everyone is feeling or experiencing similar concerns. Absolutely. And well, thank you so was... much. Thank you so much to everyone across Canada. Um, get in touch, as, as Lauren was saying there, and we hope to see you at our next webinar, which will be next quarter. Um, I'm hoping I remember it off the top of my head here. I believe it is going to be. Actually, stay with me for just 10 more seconds. I will get it for us there. Apologize, everybody. Usually I have this pulled up right away, but I was putting all the questions here. The next one's going to be coming up on October 16th. So do put that into your calendar and we look forward to having you there. Have a great night, everyone, and we'll catch you at the next one.